Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Mark McNaught, formerly uh, having done the uh, building the Scottish state, uh, but taking a break from that at this point, but, you know, uh, able to come up on, on numerous occasions when, uh, when the certain conditions merit. And I certainly think that it's worth having a discussion about free ports with um, no one more qualified to speak about free ports than Mr. Alf Baird. Uh, and so, first of all, um, welcome everybody. And I'd like to first begin by defining what the free ports are. And I'll talk about what I understand they are, and then um, Alf can fill in the details. Now, free, as I understand it, free ports are part of a leveling up scheme, uh, you know, introduced by Michael Gove. And uh, and it is to create two different zones. I for, I for uh, what, Alf, what are the two areas that what are the two ports that they wish to make into free ports? Uh, in Scotland, it's Forth Ports uh, and uh, Cromarty Firth. OK. And there's another eight or so in England. Is that correct? I think so. Uh, major ports such as Felixstowe, uh, Southampton, Liverpool. Uh, there's also an airport. I think it's West Midlands and mm -hmm. Humberside Ports, Teesport. Uh, and I think perhaps one, one in Wales, perhaps, uh, uh, yeah, on the Severn. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so from what, what I understand, they are to be basically regulatory black holes where, and I've, I've, uh, I'll make a, a document available to the viewers uh, that, that show, shows of a law firm uh, spelling out the virtues of the uh, the Freeport system and inviting people to make bids to you know become a part of the, uh, the business, different businesses and uh, uh, multinationals to become part of the Freeports and as I understand it it's to be administered initially by the certain councils and then then it's and then the direction of the Freeports is to be handed over to a private uh, body is that your understanding of the uh, of the Freeports? Well, there's to be. The, I think the local authorities are brought into it in, a, in an administrative kind of role. But uh, when the Freeport companies are established, the local authority will only have one seat out of twelve. Uh, so yeah, the local authority is somehow a, a part of the administrative uh, organisation for the Freeport, but has a relatively minor decision-making role in terms of strategy. I think. Okay, and what are the two, uh, and what are the councils which will be administered, you know, at least a very, very small part of the administration? Well, there's multiple councils because if you, if the first one, Cromarty, is also, uh, I think, Port of Inverness. So that, uh, that, that's Highland Council essentially there. But in, on the fourth, which uh, includes a whole range of councils in, in Central Region, uh, West Lothian, uh, City of Edinburgh, perhaps East Lothian and Fife Council. So there's a whole range of local authorities perhaps potentially involved in that. Okay, all right. And uh, and what is, and so the, as I, I saw a, a while ago, I saw a kind of a, a graph and it showed the companies and, and many universities that are also, uh, you know, part of this. Uh, can you, do you understand the role of the universities would play in the free ports? Well, I think they might be perhaps trying to participate in the the uh, the fiscal advantages, if you like, <laughs> from from this, because uh, there's various tax benefits through lands and building tax runs, relief. There's buildings allowances. There's enhanced capital allowances. There's also national insurance contributions. Well, what what is it? What is enhanced capital allowance? Well, I think that's I'm not an accountant, but that's uh, for investment in plant and machinery and things like that. So that gives you benefits there. So it's accountancy benefits. So it, there's quite a range of tax benefits there. There's also benefits in terms of maybe uh, aspects of planning. So port authorities might be, I don't know whether it's the case, but might be minded to, well, they are required to include Freeport master planning consent areas or to have Freeports involved in the master planning of, of, of what, the, what the plans are for the future development of the area. Uh, and to streamline decision making, whatever that means. Uh, so it's a it's a, a new regulatory regime for these areas, providing significant tax benefits in addition to trade, uh, ben import duties suspended, uh, customs duties exemptions, simplified import and export procedures for goods. <coughs> so there's a whole range of uh, fiscal and uh, tax benefits for organisations involved in the freeport. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is there any transparency whatsoever? As, as I understand it, 
initially there, there was to be a you know kind of a, a collaboration, if you will, between this the Holyrood government and the uh, and the um, and the Westminster government. Uh, and but but with with uh, there was supposed to be consultation. However, Westminster, as usual, could always overrule uh, the, the Holyrood government on the on the planning decisions. Uh, is that your understanding as well? Well, initially, uh, the Scottish government they didn't really uh, didn't, wasn't too keen to participate in this. It is a Tory policy, remember, and the Freeport's policy came out of work initially done by Rishi Sunak when he was a backbencher several years ago. I think 2016. Uh, uh, he but before he was before he was chancellor. Before he was, yeah, before yeah. he was in government, really, uh, he produced a Freeport, which uh, to some extent reminded me of uh, Freeport developments in Asia and other parts of the world, which are to do with transshipment hubs. And he maybe seen. What, what is it? What is, what is a transshipment hub? Well, a transshipment hub is where goods are imported, usually by container ship. Then they're processed within the port area and then they're re-exported again by container ships or, mm -hmm. or ferries and so on for other countries. So free ports are generally about serving international markets, not domestic markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the, the, you, the idea is to bring in multinational corporations. For example, a transshipment hub like Singapore uh, or Malta Freeport. Or these ports, Colombo, uh, Panama, Suez Canal, free, free zone. These areas where big container ships are transferring cargo there for multiple markets, mm -hmm. maybe, but not necessarily the domestic market. And this is where multinational companies can come in and have access to big warehouses there where they're storing goods, they're repackaging goods, they're maybe reprocessing goods to some extent, uh, relabeling goods, and then re-exporting goods. And that's not what the UK free ports are about. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about something else. I think it's a bit of a knee-jerk policy based on flat economic uh, growth, <laughs> mm -hmm. zero economic growth in Britain. And they're trying to, and this has happened before in Britain. Remember back in the 80s, during the Thatcher recessions, they introduced free ports then. This is mm -hmm. not new in Britain. Uh, it was introduced back then. And, and, and these free ports that were created back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, uh, were to take account of deindustrialization, the need for industrial diversification, and the need to grow the economy out of the tragedy of deindustrialization. You know, a, a, a completely destroyed economy uh, in in the UK, uh, and I know that myself because I was an economic migrant at the time. Had like thousands of, of Scots. <coughs> we, had to, we had to go to Germany and Spain for employment. Yeah. You know, we were we were economic migrants at that time. So free ports are not new. Uh, it's a Tory uh, reaction to economic uh, collapse, if you like, economic, mm -hmm. uh, just zero growth. There's, the economy is doing and also the enormous trade imbalance in England, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, OK. All right. And uh, so and is is there any uh, uh, is there any transparency whatsoever? I mean, is there any way of knowing what companies are trying to applying for? status within it and what the, what what they're uh, for example i i was reading that um, you know under the terms of the free ports uh, rather than having you know labor law uh, such as it exists in the uk to the extent it exists uh but th but that the applying companies only need to demonstrate a commitment to um uh to to fair labor practices rather than actually having law that obliges them to do so uh is, yeah I'm, I'm not a, a, an employment law specialist. All I can see here is there's benefits through uh, national in, insurance contributions uh, they, where, where the employers would be exempt uh, for salaries up to £25,000 for employees in the first three years. Oh, mm -hmm. so there's not enormous benefits. DP World, in, uh, who runs uh, the, the big container tranche, the container terminal in London Gateway Port on the Thames, they've calculated that uh, if I just have a look, they calculate the incentives uh, for uh, companies locating there. And there have been some companies located there, uh, including a Belgian company that's involved in some kind of semi-processing or manufacturing, where a big, uh, fact, a big uh, storage or logistics centre might have benefits of between two and £17 million over a five-year period. It's not enormous advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, for this, but it's that's what that's what it's about. It's about locating, bringing in business to locate within the port area or near the port area to create traffic for the port. And that was 
principally the function of free ports. And this is not the role of the free ports or what we call the green free ports in Scotland. Yes. And this is what, where what, I, what, what's with the green bit? Well, it's a bit of a greenwashing <laughs> label, if you like. It, they've been labelled green in Scotland by the SNP Scottish Government just because they're, the two poor areas, Forth and Cromarty, are uh, developing, helping to supply in the supply chain all the offshore renewable uh, wind energy developments in the east side of Scotland, particularly. Uh, so the, the Forth and Cromarty are heavily involved in that. But the, the question I have is, it's quite an obvious one, is all these offshore renewables developments were going ahead without Freeport status anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus, it's not about creating large logistics centres. This is just imports of goods from other countries uh, to then be uh, sent out to the seabed to, to, to create the wind farms. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's just the, the maintenance functions, which are relatively small scale compared to modern port developments mm -hmm. as such. So in a sense, the free ports, uh, the green free ports, the, 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 the renewables offshore developments don't need free port status. In fact, if you look at all the renewable ports uh, on the continent, in Poland, in Germany, in Holland, in Denmark, none of them have been made free ports. And they're supplying all the offshore wind farms, all the equipment to build these wind farms. So I, I don't see the logic of a free port necessarily. It's not about creating a container transshipment hub in Scotland. It's not about uh, that at all. So I don't see, it's just a label added to it green. Uh, there's not a lot of money involved in it. I think the port developers get about 20 million or 25 million from the UK government to help with infrastructure uh, at Forth and Cromarty. 25 million in port terms is relatively small. It's, it's only enough for a modest ferry terminal, if you like. Mm -hmm. It's not even enough to buy a CalMac ship. So it's not much money. And, and the, the overall benefits in employment terms and, and capital allowances, I don't see that as tremendously significant. It's not creating enormous flows of trade other than imports of, of wind turbines mm -hmm. and then installing the wind turbines and equipment on this, uh, out at sea. And that's it finished. The mm -hmm. port development then doesn't really need much additional uh, investment once the wind farms are installed, unless more wind farms are perhaps planned. So I don't see how Freeports locks into this at all. Globally, Freeports, as I say, they're about transshipment. And this mm -hmm. is not about transshipment. Okay. What do you think it is about? I mean, you know, being a, a quite cynical regarding the Tories, well, what are they up to? What are they up well, to? I, I think it's I, they've misunderstood what free ports are. And it goes back to what I said about the Tories. They're looking at the UK uh, with a very, a very worsening trade imbalance. And that, that's a UK trade imbalance. Scotland, if we talk about that separately, is doesn't have that trade imbalance. Uh, but UK as a whole has a trade imbalance where you're talking about imports, uh, sorry, exports of about under 400 billion a year, imports of over of towards 700 billion. So uh, it has a terrible trade imbalance. And probably Sunak has, has looked at this and said, well, one way to do this is to do what Asian ports and other ports in the Caribbean and others uh, have done in the Middle East is to create free ports. Uh, but you only get the benefits of trade, growing trade significantly if you become a transshipment hub. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where uh, I've worked on two projects before to develop transshipment hubs in Scotland. And that was because of the deep water we have uh, at Scapa Flow in Orkney and also in on the Clyde at Hunterston. Uh, and both of these projects were refused by a development by the UK government. Uh, they weren't supported also by the Scottish government. So the, it's important to, to recognise that, that there's a different, it, well, the, the UK port planning regime is very focused on porting, creating port developments in, in mainly the south of England. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's about it. But they're not ideally positioned for handling uh, very deep uh, draft ships, like big container ships. Uh, like Scotland is. So uh, Scotland has a, 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 perhaps a, another advantage here that we're not maximizing at the moment. Mm -hmm. And what are the big container ports within the UK? Uh, uh, and and is, uh, does Scotland have container ports of what scale and 
uh, as you were saying, there is the, the deep, deep water, so there there's potential there. But uh, yeah. what can you what can you tell us about the? Well, uh, the biggest the, ports in the UK are uh, for container shipping are London Gateway on the Thames, Southampton in Southampton, and mm -hmm. Felixstowe in Harwich Haven in uh, uh, the, the southeast of England. Uh, then you have the Mersey, Liverpool, which is much smaller uh, compared to these 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 uh, UK hub ports. That these ports all require enormous dredge, dredging costs. They, yeah. they incur enormous dredging costs. There's permanent dredges, I think, in Felixstowe, uh, where the recent dredge, I think, cost more than, more than 100 million pounds. Mm. So dredging costs are a significant part of this. What we have in Scotland is potential for container ports at uh, Scapa Flow in Orkney and, and Hunterston, where, uh, as I say, these port developments have been relatively blocked and not supported by central government. Uh, but the, Scotland has a small container port, uh, one at Greenock on the Clyde, uh, which is relatively modest, flows of container shipping, and a Grangemouth on the Forth, which handles, as far as I remember, about 200,000 containers a year, which is equivalent to what <coughs> the port of Reykjavik handles in Iceland. Okay. So it's relatively modest. What we've not seen, and I say this as a former shipping clerk in, in, in Leith going back to the 70s, is we've not seen investment in seaports in Scotland for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of Scotland's trade is dependent on ports in the south of England. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that means we incur additional logistics, land access costs and delays because of that. And we've not been able to develop our uh, international connections. OK. And what... What would be the best location in Scotland for, uh, you know, a, a, a good sized deep water port that could, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that would be would be functional? Yeah. And well, the, the, the Scapa Flow project was a, a project I was heavily involved in, also funded by the European Commission. A lot of the research on that uh, we had uh, uh, and we, we were able to track a lot of the container ships coming through the Pentland Firth, going transatlantic uh, to different trades, U.S. East Coast, Canada. Caribbean, South America, and even through Panama Canal. And these ships then head on to Hamburg, Bremerhaven, and other, and into the Baltic too. And Scapa Flow there was uh, was very well positioned and as a transshipment hub, uh, also for the Nordic Atlantic areas, Iceland, Greenland, Russia, uh, Norway, and so on. And we, uh, we uh, envisaged that that port could easily handle or develop a million containers a year, could double Scotland's international trade to about 20, uh, 20 billion, another 20 billion pounds worth of trade, create logistics uh, capacity also uh, for different uh, products such as seafood, which is a very big product in the North Atlantic, yes, and, and create a new international trading connection for Scotland. Because that's one of the virtues of transshipment hubs for a host economy, which might be a small economy like uh, Malta or so on. It creates global connections global connections. <laughs> so it makes your economy much more attractive for inward investment, uh, for development, and also for a small free port that might be located within the port itself uh, for logistics activities there to grow more traffic. Mm -hmm. But the, the basic benefit of Scapa Flow was it has 20, over 20 metres of natural deep water in a 100 square mile anchorage. It's mm -hmm. perfect in that sense. Another port development I worked on was to create a new ferry and uh, unitized and passenger port on the Firth of Forth at, uh, on the site of the former power station at Kakenzie. And that could be developed relatively quickly. Uh, it's currently not being promoted as a port. It's, it's being blocked by the local authority and uh, the port authority, uh, which is a private port company offshore registered now. Uh, so it, we don't really have a national port plan. And this is the problem in Scotland. We've not had a national port plan for a very long time, if we've ever had one. And mm. this is a real problem for developing trade because without a national port strategy, yeah, you can't really seriously develop uh, your economy. Okay. And what sort of um, rail infrastructure would, or, or road infrastructure would need to be developed to, to make these uh, port, port, the, the Well, the, ports? The, the, uh, the actual terminal at Kakenzie and to the east side of Edinburgh, uh, it's very close to the open sea. It's already rail connected. It was a power station. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, it was a coal fire. I saw, I saw, I've seen that. I've seen that before. Yeah, 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 it has railway connections already, so it's possible to have rail intermodal connections through to central Scotland to the north as well, and also to have we plan to have uh, barge connections upriver and also across to Fife to service the the massive whiskey industry that's based in Fife. That you could have a barge connection across the river, just like most European cities have these barge services as well as uh, as rail, uh, mm -hmm. such as the Seine, Antwerp. 
and mm -hmm. Rotterdam, Hamburg and so on. You have multimodal facilities, trimodal facilities, and that's what uh, Kukenzi should be. Uh, it also it prevents the, the bigger ships having to go further upriver to Resyth or Grangemouth, which is a lot of extra steaming time. And also the bridge constraint, uh, the three bridges, or the rail bridge is the main constraint, 43 metres air draft, which is too small for big ferries and cruise ships. So the infrastructure further up the river isn't suitable. The Port of Leith, of course, in Edinburgh is heavily constrained in the urban side and also has a shallow channel which is insufficient for the biggest ships. So infra infrastructure has not been developed in, in, in Scotland for ports. Hunterston on the west coast is a, nat is a natural deep water iron ore and was coal terminal as well, handling very large quantities. And that could also be developed for container, container uh, as a container port. And uh, Clydeport were considering doing that before they were acquired by an English company, Mersey Docks and Harbour Company. And once Mersey Docks and Harbour Company bought over Clydeport, they pushed all the development investment focus on the Mersey. And that's where they created a container terminal. There, despite the fact the Mersey has, has, has insufficient depth and required enormous dredging expense, which was paid for by the UK Treasury. Uh, by George Osborne, <laughs> largely paid the, the dredging costs on the Mersey at the time, if I remember right, under the, 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 this kind of levelling up idea about the north the northwest of, of England. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to move on to another subject regarding a uh, possible uh, a Scottish readmission to the uh, single market. It may be, uh, or the EEA, and it may be through the EU, it could be through EFTA, those things are being decided. But from what I can understand, uh, the the speed at which Scotland would be able to get into the EEA, of course, Scotland was part of the EU, they conformed to all of the you know different uh, the EEA requirements at the time. But I'm, I fear that, uh, but, the, but the, the speed at which Scotland is able to get into either, or, or into the EEA or the single market, will depend on how much regulatory divergence has occurred before application. And I'm concerned that if there is the art, and, and from, in my interpretation of these free ports is that they were not able to, they wouldn't have been able to do this while in the EU. And that was one of the big reasons for Brexit. So, <laughs> breakfast, Brexit. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so the, um, and so the more that there are these regulatory divergences or these regulatory black holes that are created by things like free ports, the more difficult that would get, that makes it to get back into the EEA or the European Economic Area or basically the single market, be it through the EU or through EFTA. Do you share that view? Uh, not necessarily. I think there is a concern maybe that uh, that these are creating kind of like offshore tax havens, but they uh, the, the fact is that uh, within Europe, I think there's uh, there's quite a number of free ports in, across Europe. Uh, I think there's about 70, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of them are relatively small free zones uh, located in ports. And their function is more or less, as I said, to, to bring in goods, uh, to process them, to repackage them, relabel, and re-export them. They're not mm -hmm. for the domestic economy. Uh, okay. uh, so, so this is where we're... We're not, uh, Rishi Sunak has misinterpreted the role of free ports here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also it happened under the Thatcher regime as well. Uh, the Tories did exactly the same before. Uh, as I said, back in the 80s, they created a whole range of free ports, including free zones in, in Mersey and I think London again. Uh, and, and these, these uh, eventually, uh, the legislation just just uh, ran out of time. I mean, you know, there was a time limit to these free ports. I can't remember what it was, 25 years or whatever, but around about 2000 and before 2010, the free zone status expired. Presswick Airport was also a free, a free zone. Mm -hmm. in, in Presswick Airport near Glasgow. And that was a very innovative idea. And I think that, that you know, that, because Presswick was was considered by global logistics experts and people involved in transshipment uh, research, uh, so I've, I've discovered it myself because I was involved in that research and a lot of them are, were, were uh, transport geographers. Uh, and and uh, you've got aviation hubs like Anchorage. Uh, uh, that, that is, Alaska, is, Alaska? Yeah, it's handling, yeah. Million, it's handling a large volume of goods for, for, with aviation on the, on the polar routes. And mm -hmm. this is where Presswick was I ideally positioned to link into that to do what basically Keflavik does in Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a transfer point, a mid-Atlantic a mid load centre, if you like, 
because all, all the goods coming across, all the passengers, it's mainly passengers in Keflavik, but Presswick could have had a role, for, not just for passengers, but also freight, mm -hmm. global air freight. Uh, and that would have been a, a good idea. Another transshipment hub that's uh, that's opened up actually not far from Anchorage on the on the the the, the U.S. or Canadian West Coast uh, Northwest is is Prince Rupert Port, and that's a container transshipment point. Uh, but it's rail intermodal, so you've got big ships coming in from Asia, and it's the first port in through the Aleutian chain where the ships hit the, the hit the Americas. Uh, mm. And they can discharge cargo quickly there and put it on on rail intermodal to the Midwest and even the Eastern Seaboard mm -hmm. uh, and into the US. And 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 that gets a lot of volume into that area quicker than via, say, uh, San Francisco or or even uh, Tacoma, uh, Seattle, mm -hmm. Vancouver. So uh, Scapa Flow was in that in that kind of area. And most of the transshipment hubs around the world, uh, we have to remember as well, were former naval bases. Uh, uh -huh. You know, okay. and and they were naval bases because they were at strategic intersections yeah. yes. between seas and oceans, canals. So you know, Algeciras, Gibraltar, Suez Canal, Malta, Colombo, Singapore, Hong Kong, so on, Panama. So, you know, it, it just goes on and on. Uh, and this is where Scapa Flow was very important because it's right at the entrance to the North Sea, uh, uh, and and also on the route into the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where a lot of the biggest ships can avoid, in some cases, the, the congestion and the shallow uh, ports around the North Sea Basin and the English Channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, but uh, if, if, the, uh, if these free ports are not being used, used for you know, uh, shipment, as you, as you were saying, where they come in repackaged and sent out or whatever, but it's more for the domestic market, doesn't that, I mean, and it's unregulated, would that not, you know, pose problems for aligning yeah. with European regulations for... Uh, I, I, think, I think the classic problem these free port ideas or free zones have created is whether they're just going to take uh, business from the local economy into the free zone to avoid paying taxes, to avoid paying rates, to, <laughs> to avoid paying national insurance. Uh, so they just become a... Uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they get these advantages and that just... Uh, reduces the, the tax take of the central government, in a sense, makes it attractive for local businesses. So I think there is that worry. I think I just think the Tories have, 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 have completely mistaken and uh, totally ignored the, the, the reality of free ports, which are linked to transshipment hubs. Okay. Not all right. not domestic economy. All right. Okay. All right. That, that's 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 good to clear. Yeah. Clear up. And the free, and the green free port, of course, in Scotland is just a complete. Uh, you know, misnomer. <laughs> it's not. It's a pointless exercise uh, mm -hmm. because not only do we not need free ports at these places because they're not handling container trade in any big volumes for third countries, is they don't need to be free ports at all for the green for mm -hmm. for the offshore renewables because these developments are going ahead anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to move on to the next one. Speaking of the Tories, as you correctly pointed out, this is a very much a Tory policy. Uh, and I was going through the Scott Gov website talking about free ports and got a very nice, polite letter from, uh, you know, from um, writing from Michael Gove to Kate Forbes. Oh, this is great. We're, we're cooperating on the free ports. A similarly, uh, uh, you know, a, effusive letter from Kate Forbes saying, oh, it's wonderful. We're working together. Uh, so in theory, they're, they're, you know, they're supposed to be collaborating on this. But I saw a I, I, I think I caught in the, you know, in, the, in some of the Scottish press that the the, uh, the the Scottish government has found that they're not uh, they're, they're collaborating or they're not cooperating. They're just pushing through whatever their policy. So it brings up the question is why is the Scottish government cooperating, given that, that it's a Tory policy? What are your what are your views on that? Well, I. I, I... <laughs> yeah, they, there's obviously a, a, a difference in, or there should be, you would assume, a difference in approach from London and Edinburgh being a nationalist administration in Scotland. But essentially, they're just uh, implementing a, a Tory policy here and adding a spin to it with the green washing aspect of it, <laughs> which is totally irrelevant. What, what Edinburgh should be doing is developing a ports policy to develop Port infrastructure in Scotland, which is geared to developing trade, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's not what they're doing. And the port, two port projects that I've advocated strongly, as as I mentioned, are Scapa Flow for International Container Transshipment Hub, 
uh, traffic and, and Kenzie for domestic, for ferry traffic, uh, for also uh, container feeder maybe, but also cruise shipping and other uh, related activities. So this is where, what we don't have. Uh, it, it still means that Scot Scot most of Scotland's economy is dependent on seaports in the south of England. Mm -hmm. Most of Scotland's trade goes there, and it, it goes back to also uh, the function of Scotland. Much of our trade is to is to, is, is 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 supplying England, as it were, or the rest yeah. of the UK, and that includes renewable energy, oil and gas, other goods, aggregates, and most of the whiskey goes south as well to to get exported from there. Uh, and then we have, and I've calculated that that's quite a significant value. It could be. It should be in excess of 100 billion a year quite soon. Uh, uh, and our import logistics activities all come in through England's supply chains. Mm -hmm. So Scotland is served practically entirely by London business, if you like, London mm -hmm. corporate entities. And all its exports are drained out at relatively low value. That's the other thing about our, our current situation is our exports are taken out of the country at low prices. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether that's renewable energy, we don't see any value. Oil and gas, we don't see any value, really. Uh, whiskey, we see, uh, we get quoted some figures, but actually the resale value, the retail value of whiskey is probably five or six times what we, we hear it is, uh, mm -hmm. what, the, what the export data is. And then we have a whole range of other things that's supplied to uh, London-based industries, like the retailers, the, the supermarkets and so on. Mm -hmm. And then everything coming into Scotland, practically retail, spend comes in through, as I said, England's logistics centres, England's ports. Uh, so we're kind of held captive in that economic environment, whereas not, we would have enormous advantage in Scotland if we could control these assets and actually sell these goods uh, uh, to the wider market as well uh, mm -hmm. at, at better prices and also to source goods in from the wider market directly into Scottish ports uh, f f from international markets at lower prices. Okay, uh, Alf, I'd like to get on to the, the dangers as, uh, the, of, of these free ports, assuming I don't know what state they're at at this point, uh, you know, in terms of development, I don't know what, you know, and there's very... I don't know that there's any transparency whatsoever in the applications that they're making. It's, uh, but, but how how do you see it? Well, I, I, the, I think there, there are there is a difficulty. If, if it's a new regulatory regime, uh, it's not been tested. Uh, we don't quite know what the effects are going to be. Even uh, local authorities dealing with uh, these free ports in Scotland have produced internal reports uh, saying they don't quite know what the outcomes are going to be. So nobody is really sure about what the eventual outcomes will be of these free ports. Uh, nobody has done any really detailed analysis of what they what the outcomes will be. All I can say is that uh, the, that the Tories have done this before. It's not it's not new. They've done it back in the eighties, creating a range of free ports, quite similar kinds of fiscal incentives and and tax advantages and other benefits. Uh, uh, and the by all accounts, the, the strategy was mostly a failure. It didn't work. Uh, so I I think the we. Some people might read a lot into this in terms of deregulation and everything, and I think there is a worry there. We don't quite know the the the, the outcomes, what the outcomes will be, but we do know that uh, the last time the Tories did this and created free ports, it, it didn't really do very much for the British economy. <laughs> uh, it didn't uh, it create vast. It didn't create a new competitive environment. This is the problem. What we our problem in Scotland particularly is we don't have advanced seaports. And I think this is where free ports around the world are linked to new, modern, sophisticated, mm -hmm. competitive national seaports. Mm -hmm. So you'll see this in African countries, in Middle East countries, in Asian countries, in Caribbean islands and so on. Free ports are generally connected and created to support the development of new port infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what Scotland is not getting. It's mm -hmm. not getting new poor infrastructure to serve international markets, mm -hmm. and this is where uh, this is where this is what, this is why I would link perhaps a free port in uh, to to something like the Scapafoe Container Terminal. If mm -hmm. that was a transshipment port serving twenty countries around Northern Europe, handling big ships as well as feeder ships, uh, and bringing in new trade, that might be attractive. But 
uh, essentially what the Scottish government and the British government are trying to do in the UK is not the same thing. Uh, mm. And it didn't work before, and I don't think it will work again. And, and that's pretty much it. But I think the, the other issue here is to do with port governance. Uh, yes. And I think, yes. Yeah, we, the, I wanted to bring that up. Yes. So, yeah. 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 It, 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 when you say governance, you mean, you know, basically management of the port itself. Yeah, the, the role of the public sector and the private sector yeah. within ports. And I, going back to port privatization in, in the UK back in the early 1990s, uh, I did quite a lot of research on that, which was also used by the World Bank and, and UN agencies such as uh, UNCTAD and the CLAC. And uh, it's important to, to recognize that the UK went further than any other country on in what, port in, what, in what sense? Just that they well, privatized it, everything? It, it, it didn't just usually ports just concession out the cargo handling operations. Right, right, uh, right. So you bring in somebody like AP Moeller or DP World to invest in the terminal cranes, the equipment, some infrastructure, right. run right. the terminal, but you retain a public port authority. Right. It's, it's kind of public... like it's, yeah, it's kind of like here in France with the railways. Like, you know, they, yeah. they, 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 they maybe they you know give a uh, give a contract to a private company to provide the food mm. or maybe yeah. the, the baggage handling something like that. But the basic infrastructure and yeah. Uh, so the, the port of Le Havre, for example, or the port of Dunkirk in Marseille, they they have they're a public port authority. They're part of the state. And then they concession the terminal out to maybe private operators. Mm -hmm. But the state regulate the port, the state invest in the infrastructure. Uh, so the private sector coming in, maybe buying or installing the cranes, the superstructure. Yeah. So there's a divide between infrastructure and, su and the superstructure. And this is the common concession model globally. Yeah. Throughout the EU and globally. And what the UK did was different in two respects. It, it sold not just uh, the cargo handling function, it sold the, the property rights, the land, yeah. and it sold the port authority as well. So it gave the regulator to the new private company. So what we have in, in the UK is these port estuaries are run by private groups that are now owned by offshore consortia. So fourth is owned by uh, offshore equity funds uh, that were Cayman Island, now also Canadian pension funds, other, any fund that wants to... Whatever, uh, whatever got easy, money. An, yeah. easy, an easy profit. It's got a monopoly. It's got all the land. It's got all the regulation. It's got, it's got a whole monopoly. So what, what, what the, the, the Tories did back in the, in the, in the eighties and nineties was they, they, in transport generally is they sold off all the property rights. The problem we have in Scotland is these property rights under the claim of right, the common good are held by, well, in the common good, they're held by the, <laughs> the people. <laughs> so there's a question whether they have the right to do this. And also going back, previous regimes uh, took, off, uh, took the ports, uh, say, for example, on the fourth, there's maybe 10 different ports. These were owned by the boroughs at one time. The towns. The, the, the boroughs, yes. Yeah, the, boroughs, the boroughs, they were owned yeah. by the, the communities. Uh, and this is the same as the continental model even today. The mm -hmm. communities own the ports. Uh, France is a bit different because the central state has authority. But well, on the North Continent in general uh, and Scandinavia, you'll find that mostly it's the it's the municipalities, the cities, Hamburg, so on, Rotterdam, that that control the port. Uh, okay. And okay. and and this is where uh, London policy basically transferred the the rights of the the port owners, being the boroughs, first of all to trust ports which are basically a semi-corporate entity, a kind of, it was an English kind of uh, model, uh, and then subsequently to privatization. So I think we, we need to focus much more on the governance uh, of these port uh, infrastructures, which we, we've seen lack of investment in. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so to kind of wrap up, how would you, I guess, how would you characterize this free port scheme in general? Uh, what do you... How do you think it will go? And above all, what can Scots do to stop it and to uh, and, yeah. and to, you know, to bring and also to bring out, you know, attention to it? And what are the you know, how, how do you see this and how well, do we combat I, it? I think one of the problems <coughs> in, in maritime policy generally in Scotland and, and Britain is that uh, <coughs> that that's really determined by civil servants. And what, what I noticed on the continent and most of my EU projects over more than 20 years was that uh, quite often the officials dealing with ports had 
some education in maritime policy. <laughs> <laughs> they were educated. They had, yeah, they, they, had, they, they, knew, they, knew, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, they, they usually they, had a master's degree in port economics, port policy, shipping economics, something like that. They didn't, whereas in Scotland, we get civil servants coming from education, from social work, from employment, coming into maritime ferries as well. And they don't really have sufficient basis. Yeah. Uh, they don't have any theoretical knowledge at all. Mm -hmm. So they end up making policy blunders. And I think that's fundamentally what we have uh, with this free port policy. We don't have a poli port policy in Scotland. And now we have a free port policy imposed that's very poorly thought out and isn't really sensible. It's been rebranded green for obviously uh, simplistic and inadequate reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a workable thing. What needs to be done? Well, I think Scotland really needs a maritime policy. Any country with a coastline and ports needs a maritime policy yeah. because it's basically a trade policy. And without good quality, competitive international seaports, you can't develop your trade. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem for Scotland within the UK. Its role is really, its trade role is really to serve uh, the core nation, which is England, largely. Yeah. Its, it's, its role is to serve that. And this is why all our trade is oriented towards England, yeah. largely. And all our imports are, are, are coming from England. And what all the former colonies did was reorientate the trade away from London. And that's not just Ireland. That also included Canada, Australia. Oh, Australia. yeah, everybody. Yeah. They, India, had to, uh, yeah. they had to focus their trade on Asia, the Middle East, the Africa, globally. And, and they, they had to stop sending everything through London mm -hmm. because they were all their goods were going to London cheap and all their goods were coming back from London expensive. Right. right. Uh, and this is what makes uh, a colonial model uh, or the internal colonial model, uh, dysfunctional. It leaves an economy uncompetitive, lacking development, and its people can't move out of the, the rut they're in. And mm -hmm. this is what explains Scotland's lack of development, economic growth for so long. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anything you, else you'd like to add before we conclude? Well, I think the only solution really is... Uh, like all the colonies, <laughs> decolonization. <mark. laughs> uh, we, we know it as no. independence. We, we know it as independence, but the UN tell us independence uh, for non-self-governing territories is decolonization. Mm -hmm. And that includes economic umbilical cords. Mm -hmm. And the economic umbilical cord is, is what's constraining Scotland. Okay. All right. Th thank you so much, Alf. Uh, and thank you, Peter, for uh, recording and editing and putting it out, uh, hopefully uh, quite soon. And uh, thanks so much, Alf. Thanks, Mark. All right.